it is a blessing to have her. I don't know how you think about it. I know sometimes the focus gets on the man as far as a missionary, um, but she is a missionary too, and it's a blessing to have her willing and excited to go to the mission field and give up her family and friends and comfort and things like that. So when you think of missionary, think of us both going and praying for us. So we appreciate that. I thank my wife for being with me. Um, we are the Huggins heading down to Brazil. And when you think about Brazil, a lot of people think of jungle, you know, a lot of uh, really hot, wet areas, which that is most of Brazil. But when you look at what they're doing now, they're developing out of a third world country. This is a short flight over Sao Paulo, their largest city. And Brazil itself is a large place. It's the fifth largest country in the world, fifth largest uh, in population as well. And they do, like some of you know, they speak Portuguese there. Now, as they're getting out of the third world country setting, they're getting more modern. And you guys are familiar with L.A., San Francisco traffic. Um, Sao Paulo's got some of the worst in the world. Um, they, they let you drive... <laughs> You know, one third out of the day you're allowed to drive. If you're driving any other time, you get ticketed. Uh, but you can see how the population is moving to the urban setting. That's where they want to live. There's a lot more comfort there. But you know how it is when men move and gather together without the purpose of seeking God. It always ends up bad. And as you know, what happens in the cities, there's a lot of violence, a lot of crime, uh, a lot of corruption, things like that. So. What's happened there in Brazil is there's a large prison population. It's the third largest in the world, um, only following behind China and the U.S. Um, so there's over 700,000 right now inmates in their jails. Um, so that's an open opportunity for us. We get down there. I've done prison work for probably almost 20 years now. And so we hope to get in there, uh, in the prisons there, and get to preach and teach. Uh, we have a contact in Sao Paulo already that we're hoping to connect with when we get there. Now, as far as Brazil, uh, like I said, jungle area, you think of this area called the Amazon, and you're thinking of Amazon, you guys are waiting for that package in the mail that you ordered, <laughs> but it's a completely different Amazon, hot, wet, obviously not a place where a lot of people want to live, so they move out of that area and move along the coastline, and that's where uh, Lord Willem will be for a few years working with a veteran missionary, Brother Matt Schraus. He's in a town about right here called Poço Alegre. Right south of that three hours is Sao Paulo, 20 million people. Rio de Janeiro is right there. That's 12 million people. So just in a very small area, there's around 45 million people. So there's a lot of people in that area. So Brazil itself, that's where the population is. And that's, uh, Lord willing, as he directs us, that's where we're going, where most of the people are. But this part of Brazil, you've seen it, I'm sure, in other settings different countries, you've seen poverty. And I think for us as Americans, poverty to us hits us in a way because most of us, I can say pretty sure, haven't lived like that. We haven't lived in poverty. We've never you know, gone to the cupboards and it's empty or not had you know, the things that you need to supply your, your want of the day. And these people, that's how a lot of them live. They live in that type of situation. This is what's called the favelas there in Brazil. They're their slums, their ghettos. Um, what they do is they move out of the farmlands towards the city and hopes to get a better job. And what they do is they don't, they don't have money, so they just get whatever building material they can and build up these, basically the cities within a city. And there's no, you can see there, there's no road system. Um, many times there's no running water. There's no sewer or septic system. Um, because of it's not being sanctioned by the city, there's no police stations, uh, many times no hospitals or schools. So you can kind of imagine that kind of environment, what you would have just with mobs of people on top of each other. It's very chaotic, it's very hectic, it's very dangerous. And so you think, that's not a good environment, you wouldn't want to go there. And you think about growing up there as a kid, the, the ones really that end up getting the brunt of this situation are the kids. Many times their parents, just from life being so frustrated, they abuse their kids. Many of them neglect their kids, abandon their kids. Um, so what happens is these kids leave from that environment and they go to the city central to where people will give them a handout, people will be somewhat generous to them, and then they learn how to steal. They learn how to get involved in crime and drugs themselves. 
And so these kids, basically their life is the street. That's where they begin. And that's all they know. Some of these kids start off going with their older brother and sister in diapers. And so that's the only thing they know of life. And they're involved in drugs themselves. They're involved in so many things where they have no hope. And you think that's, that's sad in itself, that you live like that. But can you imagine you die and spend eternity far worse than that? And I, I think about that. You know what? It's not because those kids are any worse than I am. And we got to see this this last time we were in Brazil. The Lord burdened me about that. I'm no better than any of these kids. There's, there's no reason why I was born here outside of God's mercy. And you know what? I want the opportunity to bring them the gospel, the most important thing I got at a young age. And that's what they need. The Bible says, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give them life and to give it more abundantly. That abundant life is not in possessions, it's not in food, it's not in clothes, it's only in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what these kids need. It's, a, it's one of the things we need you guys to pray for us about. It's a complex thing to try to get in the country and start working on that. Um, so we definitely need prayer. pastor told us the other day, is something I really appreciate. He said, prayer does things money can't. So that's what we need. We need you guys to pray for us there, that the Lord opens up doors. Thinking about religion, though, kids begging is sad. But the worst kind of beggars are really these yeah. that come into a church building and they beg thinking that it's a merciful God wanting to help yeah. them, and they go away, what, empty every time. And so right now in Brazil, the religion is the problem, mainly the Roman Catholic, 65%. Um, that's been on the decline the last few decades. Um, as far as religion, Roman Catholicism is their problem as far as religion. Right now they have these in special cathedrals in Brazil. These are wax body parts. You can't quite see it, but that's a wax hand, a wax heart, wax backbone, um, wax head on the table there, wax legs. And you'll see this in different cathedrals in Brazil. And these are called votives. These are, these are items that if you get an ailment in your body, you have a bad leg or you get headaches all the time, you take a trip to this special cathedral, you purchase this item, and you leave it there with the priest, and he prays over that, and you're supposed to get healed. Well, what happens if you don't get healed? Well, they tell you you need to take another pilgrimage, come back, bring more money, because you don't have enough faith. So what do, what do the Brazilians really learn it's about? They learn it's not about faith, it's not about God being good, it's about money. And so right now they're starting to look for other things. Unfortunately, they're going to Pentecostals and all the other different things outside of the Catholic Church, but they're realizing it's about that. They're realizing it's about building a kingdom on this earth. Right outside the favelas and the poor people and everything, here's these people live, building these huge cathedrals, very nice and lavish. And so... That's what Brazilians are seeing about religion. But what do they have to turn to if the truth's not there? If there's not somebody sent to go bring them the gospel? And that's what we hope to do. Um, follow kind of in the footsteps. This man here, he's Joseph Domingos. Him and his wife, Lori, they were missionaries 35 years. I visited them in uh, 2002 at that time. And he had started about nine different churches. Lord started burdening me about that. Um, I wanted to visit a mission field. Not necessarily, I didn't feel directly called to Brazil. I just wanted to see how the Lord worked overseas. And I would prayed about it. If the Lord wanted me to come back officially taking a trip on a survey trip to see if God wanted me in the Brazil, he'd let me see somebody get saved. And we were the last day of the meeting. Uh, nobody was in there. Nobody's coming in. The church building actually was a little bigger than this, but it had flooded. Um, the city came through and raised the street level, and so every time it rained, which was often, it flooded the church building. So they couldn't meet there. We were meeting in a utility shed about a little smaller in this room, and I figured nobody's going to come in. Nobody's going to visit. Nobody's going to want to be in a place like that. And thankfully, against my understanding, somebody came in. This man here, he heard the singing and the music coming from the church building and walked in off the street. Um, really, he's trying to find somebody to, to ride with to the next town over. And thankfully, instead of finding his way to the next town, he found his way to heaven. Amen. So that was an answer to my prayer. The Lord directed me to try to get back to Brazil. He had postponed that a few times um, for different reasons. I've learned now why. 
um, Lord saw me. He said, you're going to need a lot of help. So he gave me a help me. Um, we got married in 2008, and that's a great blessing. He also wanted me to learn how to minister, and I believe I learned from the best. The uh, Lord wanted me to stay there in Pensacola and help out with my dad, um, pastor in the church there, Dr. Uckman. And that was a great blessing to me, to see somebody that was in their 90s, you know, going out there, yes. preaching in the jails, you know, hardly able to walk, you know, had a messed up back and bad legs, hobbling down the aisle and preach for two hours, wow. sometimes three or four hours a day, and then get outside in the van and weep over those guys and say, when's, when's my next chance to preach to them? Wow. That's what I want. That's Amen. a minister's heart. Amen. And so that's what I needed to learn. That's what I needed to see. And, and try to get that there about Brazil. Now, 2016, my wife and I, we went on a trip again to Brazil, got to visit Brother Matt Schraus there. He did, uh, he let us preach there a couple times. Um, first night we were there, as far as preaching, we got to see some folks get saved. This lady, Andrelli, she's one of the church members' niece. They had been working on her. She came out that first night and got saved, uh, along with these two young boys, Paulo and Gabriel. Um, to the church members' kids. We had, uh, later on, there was a special meeting on a Friday night. The man here, um, Alvaru, he invited his neighbor. His name is Joe. Joe came out to church, and he got saved that first night he was there. And the last night we were there um, doing a service there at the, the church, this lady came next to my wife. She ended up getting saved. Her name is Bruna. And she was a co-worker of one of the church folks. And I show you that. One to show you is that the church people there were burdened for their community. They wanted those people to have what they already had. They wanted them to have salvation. And so they reached out to whoever they could, their friends, their family, their co-workers, anybody they could. Get them the opportunity to hear the gospel. Now, that's not what it was all about there in Brazil. We got to go out on the street, um, do some uh, street preaching, open air preaching, passing out tracts, uh, holding up scripture signs. And thankfully, there in Brazil, they haven't learned that street preaching doesn't work. Um, so this guy here, Umberto, he walked across the street after hearing the preaching, and the lady there from Matt's church led him to the Lord. He got saved that day, and another lady, Sandra, got saved as well later on. But to us, really, you think about that, um, I don't know how big of a thing that is to you, but seven souls having their eternity changed. And right now, for me, I know that's the will of God. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's our job, is to lead them that way. And that's a great blessing to see that. But you know what? You say you've heard of missionaries in Brazil. Why is it there's a need for more? Well, really, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. There is a lot of people there being deceived by religion, by their own life, whatever it may be, dying and going to hell. So a few missionaries is not going to reach it. We need uh, laborers. Like the Lord said, when he looked over the harvest, he said the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of a harvest, he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. The Lord pointed out the problem's not the world. The problem's the laborers not going. And so that's what he asked for us to do is pray about that. We ask you guys to do the same. Pray for us. We're the Huggins heading to Brazil. And think of it like this. A uh, lady came up, told us, a couple months ago, she said, you guys have a friendly last name. We have a friendly last name. A little boy was trying to remember our name, praying for us. She's like, dear Lord, I pray you'd bless those missionaries. Pray you'd bless brother. And he paused. He couldn't remember the name. He said, pray you bless brother, brother Hug as he goes to Brazil. And if that's all you can remember, the Lord knows exactly who it is. So just pray for us, whoever we are, just pray for us. So, All right. And so I want you to open up to Isaiah chapter 5. And this is more of a, more of something just from the from the heart. Um, it's something that I believe, as far as I know, I've, I'm, I would say I'm the most spoiled Christian here, especially and probably in the world. Um, Lord's given me so many breaks, given me so many benefits um, that I, I could stand here all day and tell you about it. Um, but really, would like to give you an idea as far as that in a sermon to give you an understanding of what. The Lord does, and I know for one thing is you're reading through the Bible and you're learning about these different people, and I know the Lord puts this in there and he waits till you react 
He, he tells you something about Israel, and he's, he's watching your reaction, and your, your reaction about Israel is, you know what, these people are so stiff-necked and rebellious, and I, I just, I can't believe, like, years and years ago, the Lord just didn't wipe them out, and, you know, it's just one of them things where you're like, how many times can he be so good to them at one point, and then they turn around and rebel and complain over the least little thing. And right in the middle of that thought, you know how the Lord works. He yeah. bumps you on the shoulder says, hey, <laughs> dummy, that's you. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's where we're at here in Israel. We're, we're talking about this passage here in, about the children of Israel. The Lord's giving them a parable to help them understand what he's done. You know what? The Lord's so good to us, many times we don't see the obvious. Yeah. He has to lay it out for you, give you a story, and then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, the Lord is good to us. Because you don't see it every day. You don't see that you have health. Okay, the Lord's good. You're breathing here. You're not hooked up to a hospital bed here. God's good to you. And you don't realize that until the Lord lays it out for you. And that's what we hope to do here this morning is give you something that will encourage you as far as the Lord's goodness. So if you're in Isaiah chapter 5, we'll go ahead and read this passage. Isaiah chapter 5 and just... See what the, the parable here about the Lord's vineyard has for us. Verse 1, he says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and brought it forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Before we get into the message, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with these folks. Lord, thank you for the blessing of having brethren that are willing to gather together and praise you and glorify you and lift you up, even in a, a wicked place that surrounds it. Lord, I pray you'd uh, charge them and strengthen them to keep being a light in this world. Lord, until you come, Lord, I pray you'd help the, the people here and the church here to increase and grow. And Lord, I pray your blessing would be upon it as they get a new building and all the things that are happening with them, Lord. I pray you'd smile upon this place. Lord, thank you for what you've done already. Thank you for your goodness. And Lord, I pray you'd uh, again be with us here today. Remove anything that would take your glory from you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, understanding that, the Lord's vineyard. The Lord's vineyard, he talks about that in the passage he talks about singing, uh, talks about giving a song there uh, about a vineyard. And this vineyard, I don't know if you know much about gardening or anything like that, but talking about growing things, it takes a lot of work to grow stuff sometimes. Uh, I learned that because my dad, he liked, he liked gardening, and we got into it as kids and things like that. And he started doing some gardening. He had this thing called manure tea. And he'd get us to get this big pile of chicken manure and, and get a shovel and shovel it into a five-gallon bucket. And you'd shovel that into that five-gallon bucket. And as you're putting it in there, that stuff you'd leave there for about a month. And you'd let it sit there sometimes a month, two months. And it'd be out there in that Florida sun and get heating up and all that kind of stuff. And then he'd say, all right, now it's time to get the stuff out and spread it out through the plants. And that's what we'd do. We'd, we'd pop that lid off of that and get that stuff, and he'd say, pour it out at the base of all these plants. And we would. We'd run up and down those aisles in the garden there and pour in that stuff. And little kids, you know, we're, we're wanting to get it done as fast as possible, right? <laughs> so you're running around with that bucket, and it's sloshing all over you and getting all over your arms, getting all over your legs, you know, and that stuff's awful. Nope. You're not going to drink it. It's, it's tea, but you're not going to drink it. And you think about that. We'd get that stuff on us, and we'd go inside. Mom would fix us lunch. And we're sitting down there eating that lunch, you know, and washed our hands real good, and washed them again. And you know what it tastes like? It tastes like manure tea. <laughs> everything you touch, everything you eat was just nasty. But you know what happened two or three months down the road? You go out to that garden, their plants are just huge. Big plants, big fruit. And you notice there in the passage in Isaiah, it talks there that he planted that vineyard in verse 1 in a fruitful hill. The first thing we notice about this text here is about the provision. 
the provision of God. God has a provision there. And you know what? That, that providing in this vineyard is very good. And it's on a fruitful hill. When I think about a hill, I can't think of a more fruitful hill than that hill called Calvary. Amen. And you say, well, why did you tell us that story about that nasty manure tea? Well, you think about that. Jesus Christ, what did he have to do? He had to bear that filth That's right. in his body to do what? To bring fruit in your life. That's good. Yeah, that to bring good. fruit in my life. Yeah. To, to make something fruitful, it's dirty work. Yeah. It's wow. dirty work. And you know what? God's provided something for you that he had to get his hands dirty for. Yeah. So you ought to thank God for the provision he has in this fruitful hill. That provision he has. He made a, a fruitful hill. I think about that. I told you I was going to wait a little bit about my testimony. And I think about my upbringing. Sometimes you... You get uh, desirous of a different story or a different thing like that. But I realize when I stop and think, God's given me the best testimony I could have. I think about my salvation testimony. How I got saved was started off long before I ever even really came to the scene. And I was a young boy, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But even before all that happened, my great-great-grandfather, he, he was a farmer. He's a farmer up north of Pensacola and... Nothing really special, not really a, a deeply spiritual man, but he wanted to have church. He, they only had church one Sunday out of a month. They had to share their church with the, you know, the Methodists and the Lutherans and all that. They had a community church. And so he desired to have you know, Sunday, every, every Sunday have church. So he designated a part of his land, his farmland, that brought him money. He said, you know what, I'm going to give up some of this so we can have a church building. So that's what he did. He set that up. They built a church building on that. And you know what? That church thrived. They had a good work going there and everything like that. That church got going and you know everything went well. And years and years down the road, almost 100 years from the time my great-great-grandfather did that, I'm a, I'm a little boy. I'm a young boy sitting in a, in a congregation of a church and I hear the preacher preaching on hell. Or at least I think he was. He may have only said it once, but you know, thank God it scared the hell out of me. Yeah, you know, and I didn't want to go there. I turned to my mom. I said, "Mom, what do I do?" She said, "Okay, well, opened up her Bible, showed me in the Acts 16 how to be saved, and I got saved in that church building." And I, I thought about that. I didn't know what happened until years and years later. That about 10 years ago, I found out that same piece of property was the same piece of property my great great grandfather donated to be a church building. All the Baptist church sits there in Pensacola now. The place I got saved was connected to somebody else sacrificing. How about that? Wow. And I think about that. You know what? That's all of our lives. Somebody sacrificed to get you here today. Somebody sacrificed to get you the truth. Somewhere down the line, God's made some provision for you in your life. And you know what? We look at Israel and we say, you know what? How, how is it that Israel is so rebellious and so backwards and undone and all this but you know what again reality that's that's us that's us that's how God does and he's so good to us and he blesses us so much why is it we would stray from him why is it well, like the brother was saying why would we get cold towards him it's not because he hadn't been good he's been very good so that's the provision that's the provision in this vineyard that providing I think about not only just the providing in the vineyard, but you think about the country that you're in. I, I think about Christianity. I talked about a Muslim today, you know, and I was thanking God while I was talking to him. I'm not in a mixed up religion like he was. But you know what? Aside from just being a Christian in this country, you know what? You think about how good this country has it. That we can do what we did this morning, go out on the street. and You know what? You don't get that opportunity everywhere. That's right. Unless you get slapped in jail. You know what? You don't realize it, but that's a privilege. That's a blessing that you get to take part in that. That you get to participate in an activity that pleases God. The world hates it, but God loves it. Amen. You know what? And you can do it without any persecution in this country. Yes, I think about that. This lady, her name was Irina. I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. But Irina, she was a, she was a Russian and she is a librarian. She worked in the library there in Russia and back in the USSR. And she came across an old Slavic Bible. And this old Slavic Bible, she got a hold of that thing and started reading it. And she found out about the love of God and found out how much God loved her and enough to die for. And she ended up trusting Christ as her Savior there in that country. 
And she started the best church she could go to. She went to it. It was an old Russian Orthodox church, not really anything special, just whatever she could do. And she was going to that church, and what happened was the KJB were there, and they were secretly there trying to find out who the real Christians were. They, they didn't care about the Christians that just showed up and played church on Sunday. They wanted to find out who the real Christians were. And so they found out she was a real Christian. So guess what they did with her? They threw her in Siberian prison camp. And they gave her, all they gave her was a nightgown, bread and water for her meals. She'd sit there almost freezing to death during the winter. And you say, why did that happen to her? For what you're doing here today. Just in a different country. Just where you have liberty. You ought to thank God for his provision that he's provided in this country. You say, what happened with her? Well, she ended up getting a, a toothache one day so bad where her, her head was about pounding out, you know, and she couldn't do anything of it. She woke up and her face was all swollen, had a big abscess tooth, and was begging the guards to help her out. She was in so much pain. And they brought her in there, strapped her down to a chair there, and says, hey, if you'll just recant from being a Christian, we'll give you some anesthetic and pull this thing out. If not, you know what will happen. So they extracted that tooth without any anesthetic because she's a Christian, a real Christian. And you say, what happened to her? Well, she got freed from that prison there, and they uh, ended up, the president of the U.S. went over there and negotiated her freedom, and she got sent back to London. You say, well, when did that happen? That happened back in the Dark Ages and all that? No, that happened in the 80s. President Reagan went over there and negotiated her freedom. You know what she said when she got back to London? The news reporters came and asked her, what do you think about being a Christian in the USSR? She said it's not a very pragmatic thing to be in that country. And you know what that's saying? It's not very effective. It's not very helpful to be a Christian in a communist country. You know why? Because it cost her freedom. It cost her comfort. It cost her everything in her life. You think about what did it cost you to be a Christian here today? And you have to beg people to come out and hear the word of God and sing with the brethren and, and you have freedom and God's provided for you and you don't take advantage of it. You don't want to have to answer to God for that. That's the provision he's given in this vineyard. God's provided very well in this country. You think about the church you're in. I think about this all the time as we travel around the country. We're seeing all these churches and it's a blessing to be in a Bible believing church. You know, that Bible is the authority in this church. It's not how you feel. Sometimes that Bible goes against your feeling and you say, why did the pastor have to say that? Because that book's important, not your feelings. And you know what? Sometimes it takes Christians a while to figure that out. But you know what? That's a help for you. A friend is somebody that's going to tell you the hard things in life and not spare your feelings. You know, you've got a church where that happens. That's a blessing. You ought to be thankful for that provision God's given to you here. I think about that. This lady, her name was uh, Simpson. I forget, Joyce or something like that. But she was a, a singer, a pop singer. And she was out there singing. She had this real milky conversion. She had gotten saved and all this kind of stuff. And she uh, was getting under conviction, she said, about wanting to do more for God. And she didn't realize what she should do. And she finally was, was trying to find out what God would have her to do in her life. She didn't know if she should give up her career as a singer and join the church full time. And she said, one day I was thinking about that and I got my answer. I got my answer. I was riding down the road in Atlanta and I looked up and I saw a, a Pizza Hut commercial sitting up there. And that Pizza Hut commercial there had a, had a big thing of spaghetti. And that spaghetti was drooping down off of that fork. And I saw the face of Jesus in that spaghetti. <laughs> And I knew I should quit my job and join the church. And I thought, how silly. That's the right reaction. You ought to laugh. It's funny. But you think, how silly is that? To be looking on billboards and spaghetti to find out what God wants you to do. When you've got a perfectly inspired book where you can see the face of God. You think about that. Where did you learn that? The world didn't teach you there. You probably learned it in this church. You ought to thank God for your provisions that he's given to you. That you're not looking in a bowl full of spaghetti to find the will of God. So you think about that. That's the provision. Now, beyond that, what do you see? Well, you look back in that passage, look back in Isaiah, look at verse 2. We've noticed the provision. Now we'll look at the protection of this vineyard. 
Verse 2, he says, he fenced it. He fenced it. You know, that's almost a curse word nowadays. And, and Laodicean Christianity is separation. Separate from the world. Come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. People don't like that. They don't like being different than the world. It makes them feel awkward. It makes them feel uncomfortable. But you know what? God made you different. You have to fight against the work of God in your heart to join up with the world. Wow. You know what? That's not how he wants you to be. He put a fence there and he says, I want you to be different. I'm separating you from the world. And you know what? You have to break that thing down. You know what? God's given you some protection. He's given you something to protect you from this world. You say, why does he do that? Well, one, so you don't have to be condemned with the world. So when that judgment falls and that judgment comes, that you know what, you can get bypassed from that. And you don't have to be like Lot, losing everything you have, trying to not be separated from the world. That's what you don't want. He fenced it. He put that fence there to protect it and to give it some separation from that. He also mentioned there, he gathered out the stones thereof out of the midst of it. You know what the Lord's done is he's pulled out some of the difficult things out of your life. You know what, thankfully nobody here, you're worried about infant baptism. You're not worried about, oh, did I get baptized by the right person as a baby? You know why? Somebody already pulled that stone out of your garden. Somebody already did the work so you understand that it's not necessary. You know what, there's been a lot of protection from false doctrine that you get just from where you're at here today. You ought to be thankful for that. That ought to be something that blesses your soul. And you think about that. That's the protecting in this vineyard. You notice there also in verse 2 that he planted it with the choicest vine. He planted it with the choicest vine. You know what? I can't think of the most, the, a choicer vine than Jesus Christ. That's right, Amen. You mentioned that. There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. You know what? No matter what happens, no matter what I do in my life, you know what, I'm a, I'm a scoundrel, I'm a bad person, I'm a wicked old sinner. But you know what, there's a friend of sinners. Jesus Christ come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He, he was known in his earthly ministry as a friend of publicans and sinners. I'll never stop being a sinner until he calls me to glory. And you know what, God didn't say, oh, I'm going to wait till you get to glory and then plant you near the choice vine. He says, you know what, you can fellowship with him now. You can be close to him now. I'm going to let you walk with him now. And you know what he says? Be content with whatever things you have. Because he saith, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You know what ought to bless you is Jesus Christ. He's not going to leave you. He's Amen. not going to forsake you. You know what that ought to create inside of you? Yeah, thank you, Lord. Contentment. Contentment. You know why you're not content as a Christian? Probably because you're not walking with him. You're not close to that choice vine that you should be near. That's the reason. God's put some protection in your life. He also, put a, he also put a tower in the midst of that there in verse 2, you notice. He put that tower there. You say, what's that tower for? Well, that tower is in the midst there when, when troubles and sin and all this stuff comes up in your life and you notice that stuff comes up. You know what that tower does? It gives you a warning. It gives you a warning of something that's not correct, something that's not right in your life. You know what that is? That's like your conscience. God put a conscience inside of you that's supposed to bear witness. And it's supposed to point out some things that when you do wrong and when you sin and when you go against the law of God that's written in your heart, that conscience irks you. Those old uh, Indians, those old American Indians used to describe that conscience as a triangle inside your heart. It's a little triangle like that. That thing's inside your heart and when that, that turns, you face a decision you're not supposed to do and you go the wrong way, that little triangle turns. And it pokes you and it hurts you on the inside. And you say, ooh, man, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have gone there. And what happens after you go there time and time again and do it over and over and over and over again? That triangle, the corners that used to poke you and hurt you and make you aware that it was wrong, wears down. And it becomes a nice, smooth circle. And guess what you do? You can do it all day long and never feel convicted about it because you've seared that conscience. That tower that was meant to be a warning to you of harm coming in is now useless. You know what? That's what God's put inside of you. He's put that in there to be a warning of the danger that's around you all the time. And you know what? That's the protection. The protection that God's put in that vineyard. God's done some things to make everything possible. Everything possible for you to bring forth good fruit. 
And what happens? Well, you notice there in verse 3, the producing. What is the producing of this vineyard? Well, he went to that vineyard and he looked. And what did he see? He looked and thought it should bring forth good grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. You know, it's so many Christians, they get so bound up and they get so worried about somebody else coming by and inspecting their vineyard. They don't care about what God thinks about it. You know what? The only person that matters that can actually inspect what you're producing is the Lord Jesus Christ. When you start worrying about, oh, what does brother so-and-so think? What does sister so-and-so think? You're in trouble. You're automatically producing the wrong fruit because you're worried about what man thinks more than God. You know what? You ought to be concerned about what does the Lord Jesus think about my life? The brethren may not like it. They may despise it. They may hate it. But you know what? If Jesus Christ smiles on it, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. Amen. My dad used to say, he used to say, anything with thy smile and nothing with thy frown. Nothing with thy frown. If that you can live that in your life and you think about that, you can handle anything. You can take on anything in this life as long as God's smiling on you. But you can't handle nothing if his smile isn't on you, if he's frowning on your life. That's the way it ought to be. The producing of this vineyard. What did this vineyard produce? Well, it produced some wild grapes. You know what people say? Well, I produced that wild stuff. I didn't do well because my environment wasn't so good. I lived in a, a bad situation, a bad neighborhood. and you know I didn't have a good family like you did and all this kind of stuff. And you know what? That's a bunch of baloney. It doesn't matter your environment. It doesn't matter how bad you had it coming up. You know, you put the two innocent people in a perfect environment, what happens? They mess it up. You know what? It doesn't matter about the environment. What matters is, are you doing and producing what God wants you to produce? Now, you stop and consider that. The producing of this vineyard. You say, well, I didn't have the benefits that you have. Well, I, I hate it for you. I wish you did. I wish you had those benefits. But the fact is, is God's given you enough. He's given you everything you need to produce good fruit for Him. The only excuse is yours. It's it's only something you've neglected to do. So you notice there in this passage, you notice there in verse 3 there, the producing that was done was that it brought forth wild grapes. Brought forth wild grapes. And you know what? That's not God's fault. You can try to fool yourself and blame God and get mad with Him and things like that, but it's not His fault. One thing that encourages me is sometimes these lost people have more character about the things of God than even even the saved folks do. I read this story. This guy's name was Bob Wiseland. Bob Wiseland, he was he was an athlete of an athlete. Man, he was one of those guys that was just an excellent athlete. Got out there and did all kinds of races and things like that, and just was an amazing guy. And he got drafted into the military. He was actually training to go into uh, to be a athlete for the Olympics. But they called him in and drafted him in, and he ended up having to go to uh, Vietnam. Vietnam, he got wounded, and they sent him back. You know, he couldn't survive that. You know, they sent him back after his wounds, but that didn't slow him down. That didn't stop him from being an athlete. And he ended up still practicing and all that kind of stuff, and he entered into all kinds of competitions. He ended up doing the Boston Marathons and the triathlons and the Ironman competitions and things like that. And... The strange thing about it is everybody wanted to see him compete because he had no legs. Bob Wiseland did all of that stuff with no legs below the knee. And you say, how did he do that? Well, he learned how to walk on his hands and run on his hands. Marathons. You say, how did he do that? He didn't focus on what he lost. He focused on what he still had. So many times you're worried about, Lord, what did you take from me? Lord, what you didn't give to me? And why can't I serve you like so-and-so if you just give me this? You know what? You're focusing on what you don't have. God's saying focus on what you got. Focus on them hands. If all you can do is walk on your hands, do that for the Lord. He's given you enough to bring forth fruit for him. The only reason why you don't is for selfish reasons. That's the producing of this vineyard. Now what happens when this vineyard produces wild grapes God comes by and he ponders he ponders in this vineyard what does he ponder you notice there in verse 4 you notice there in verse 4 he says what more could have been done in my vineyard than I could have not done in it you know what he comes by and says 
He comes by and says, was there, was there anything else I could have done to give this vineyard a chance to produce good fruit? And he sits there and wonders. He says, could I give you a better country to live in? Could I give you better health? Could I give you a better church to be brought up in? He wonders, why didn't you bring forth good fruit? He ponders over that vineyard. And you know what? That's a, that's a shameful thing when God's done all the things He's done to provide for you and bring forth this great provision that He's done for you and there's nothing but wild grapes. There's nothing but wild grapes. That's the pondering there of the vineyard. He wonders, what more? What more could have been done in my vineyard than I have not done in it? So you notice that after the pondering, what does the Lord do? What does the Lord do? Well, he punishes that vineyard. It's the strangest punishment you'd imagine. It's not what you'd think. Look at verse 5. He says, and go, and go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and will break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. You say, what's the punishment of that vineyard? I, I believe it's one of the strangest things the Lord does, and I believe it's the most terrifying thing the Lord does. As the Lord simply just lets that thing grow as it wants to grow. He lets that vineyard go. You know what, it, what, what happens in that vineyard? He no longer prunes that vineyard. The parts of that, that vine that's growing up that should be cut back so it could bring forth good fruit, he just lets it grow wild. That flesh that should be drawn back and brought back in your life, he just lets it grow and you don't produce anything but just stuff for yourself. Good you say, what happens after that? Well, he just lets those thorns and briars grow up in it. Those little sins that you say, well, it's not a big deal. It doesn't affect so and so. It doesn't affect me. I can quit it when I want to. And those thorns and briars will grow up where it used to be cut back. Lord just lets that go. You say, what happens with that wall separation? Well, he just lets that wall break down. He lets you blend in with the world. You don't look any different than this world. You're just like, and you have the lousiest testimony, just like Lot. Nobody's going to listen to you because he's allowed you to be just like the world. You say, that's the worst kind of punishment. Yeah, I believe that is. The Lord just lets you be what you want to be outside of his favor. You say, what else happens in there? Well, you notice that the wall gets broken down there, and you notice that the rain doesn't get rained, it doesn't get pruned. And the thing there you notice in verse 6 at the end, he says, I'll command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. You say, what is that? Well, you may, be, you may be getting a hold of it here today. You may be getting a hold of it next week. The preacher could get up, and he could be preaching something, and you know, after the service is over, brother so-and-so comes by and says, man, that was a blessing, that was great. I'm glad we got a hold of something here today and the Lord blessed us. And you may be looking at him like a calf looking at a new gate. And you may think, what in the world is he talking about? And you didn't feel God touch you at all. And you say, wait, why might that be? Well, those clouds may have come by and just rained on somebody, but not you. The Lord may have reached over heaven and touched somebody, but not you. You say, why is that? Well, maybe inspect your life and look and say, am I bringing forth good fruit? Good. Or maybe I'm bringing forth wild grapes. That's the punishment. The punishment is not that God reaches down and smacks you on the head and says, boy, straighten up. That's a blessing when God chastens you. When God chastens you, it knows that, that he loves you and he's still wanting to correct you and use you. When he just takes his hands off and lets you grow as you want to, you ought to fear that. When you can come to church day and day and time and time again and not feel the Lord tug at your heart at any time, Maybe that rain has stopped. Maybe that dry out wilderness of your heart hasn't felt moisture in years. And you know what? You need to realize that maybe you've been producing some wild grapes. And when you think about that, you think about what is this? The purpose of this vineyard is to produce good fruit. The purpose is for you to produce good fruit because you know what? It pleases God. And you know what, I'm, I'm not unaware of what goes on, and I realize, you know what, there's Christians here today that you're fearful of letting God allow you to bring forth good fruit, because you know what's in that, that vineyard? There's a wine press in there. What happens to that wine press? He takes sometimes the very best grapes he's got, 
and he puts it in that wine press and he smashes that stuff out and the, the best part of the grape comes out after the outside breaks away. You know, that's what God wants to do with your work sometimes. You're producing some of the best things. You know what? God just takes it and breaks it down. Why? So he gets all the glory. Amen. The Lord's vineyard is not about the vineyard. It's about what it produces for the master. And you know what? He comes by and he looks that it should bring forth grapes, good grapes. And what did it bring forth? Wild grapes. Maybe uh, look at yourself here today and examine. Has God been good to you? I believe we all can say he did. Has he protected you from some things? I believe you could say he has. Take a look at what you've been producing in your life. Are you worried about pleasing the brethren? Or are you worried about pleasing him? Something to consider here today. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank for this day. Thank you for the opportunity again to be with these folks. Lord, it's a blessing to have your word. and It's a blessing to have you deal with us and Show us things that need to be straightened out and briars that need to be pulled out of the garden of our heart. Lord, thank you for the pruning many times that we don't enjoy it in the moment, but Lord, we know it's for our good. Lord, thank you for putting up a, a hedge and a fence around us to keep us separate from the world. Lord, I pray you'd help us to, to bring forth good fruit, things that please you. Help us not to despise the good things you have given to us already. Lord, thank you for Calvary and the provision you made for us there. Help us to love you more each and every day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, we'll open up altar calls with every head down, every eye shut. I'm sure that you would like to take some time to pray to the Lord. And, uh, perhaps the cloud passed by and went to someone else. What's your opinion like? Is God smashing the grapes? Instead of whining about it, why don't you realize this is something that gives glory to the master? You know, God has been so good to you. I mean, you got to realize this, especially in this area, you, you should be very thankful. We live in a very liberal area. A lot of people who live in Laodicea, they don't have a desire for... God and for truth. Gave you the choices, didn't he, in this area? No. Nah. <laughs> Give you the choices. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have that big of a building, and, and, you know, we only have this many members, and they're so small, and I went through hard times, and I've lost my friends, I lost my family. You got the choices vineyard. Amen. Nah. And they don't have it. So they hate you when you got the choices vineyard. You know what they got? They got wild. They got wild. You got the choices. Bible reading and prayer should not feel like a duty. You should feel a blessed time that, wow, you've given me an opportunity, Lord, to fellowship with you. And you didn't have to give me that choices being there to fellowship with you. The worst thing God can ever do with you is that when that chastening rod stops is when he lets you go. And do you see that in your life? And that's why you're more backsliding a little more, right? That's why your spiritual walk is getting slower, right? Is he letting you go? Is he letting you go? Amen. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to the church service. We're going to take up uh, the love offering. If uh, Brother Tom can come forward and take up the love offering for us. So this one is specifically for our missionary. That was good preaching, amen? Amen. amen. That was good preaching. Amen. Uh, so we're going to have Brother Tom uh, pray over the love offering. And then this will be, uh, if you're going to write a check, do not write it to San Jose Bible Baptist Church, because we will take that money, all right? Give it to... Please give it, address it to Michael Huggins, okay? Michael Huggins, please. All right, uh, how you spell his name is not hug, okay? So, <laughs> like you said, H-U-G-G-I-N-S, all right? H-U-G-G-I-N-S. Is that right, Huggins? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. All right, so, go ahead, bro. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the great preaching today, Lord. It was, it was a huge blessing. I'm sure it touched many of us, Lord. 
Um, what really touched me was the fact that Brother Huggins and his family has such a big heart for these people that, that are in Brazil. Um, I think about this a lot. How many times do we pass somebody on the street and we don't really think about where they're going? And um, I think that it's, these people have a very special heart to really have such a burden for these children. And we sit here and we, you know, we watch the TV screen and we see, on, see these children in these third world countries. Oh, I guess it's, it's another place. doesn't really apply to me. I'm here. That's right. We're here and it's not because of us. And Lord, so that's why I ask that you'll please help these brethren go over there and do your work the best they can, Lord. I pray that you'll bless it and, you know, protect them and give them fruit, Lord. Let us give cheerfully for this great cause, Lord, because we want everybody to go to heaven with us, as many people as we can. We want to drag them out of hell and just that's right. take their hands and bring them up with us, Lord. So please, let us give cheerfully for this cause. It, I, we know how important it is. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm very happy to announce, I know that we're a small church, but you've all been giving very faithfully, and the Lord has blessed and honored it. So I am very confident to say, because looking at the money rate that we're going, I'm very happy to say that we can support our Amen. eighth vision. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Amen. so we'll be supporting our eighth missionary. Thank you so much Amen. for your giving to the Lord. See, it's from the heart. Yeah. I always had some members, you know, oh, pastor, is this money enough? And I was like, don't worry, the Lord will bless right. it. That's right. Yeah. Just put your heart in it. And yeah. since everyone's heart is in it, look what the Lord did now. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine eight right now, right? Is it eight? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, eight missionaries. Amen. In a small trip. Amen. Can you believe that? That's, yeah. The Lord takes care of everything. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, 
There are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. But you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting and screaming and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Woe unto the wicked. And I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Give me your power, Lord. You know what we need? We need people to fall on their knees. We need people to pray to the Lord, raise the King James Bible high, believe in this sensational truth, and Lord, I just don't want their power. I pray like Elisha, double the portion, Lord. Fill it within me. Fill it within me the filling power of your spirit. Give me your power, Lord. Give me your power. Give me your power. And God, the Holy Spirit, will move upon this church and fill within him his Holy Spirit power. Amen. Then we'll see soul saved. Then we'll see God do something with this church. Then we'll see the liberals and the homosexuals getting up there. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, we have not seen such a thing. Brothers and sisters, there's only one hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the man God, our Savior, Jesus Christ.